Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Patrick Wang, who's one of the finest American filmmakers working today. He'll hate that I said that, but it's true. His debut feature, In the Family, was a stunning, deeply empathetic character study in which he also starred, and his follow-up, an adaptation of Leah Hager Cohen's The Grief of Others, was similarly delicate and sharply observed. His new film, A Bread Factory, which just arrived on iTunes and hits DVD and Blu-ray on November 5th, is a two-part, four-hour drama about a small-town theater space being taken over by big-city performance artists. It's about community, it's about gentrification, and that means it's about America. It's tremendous, and you need to see it. Patrick picked Electric Light in Blue, James William Garcia's 1973 one-off starring Robert Blake as John Wintergreen, an Arizona highway patrolman who inserts himself into a murder investigation in order to move up the ladder, only to find his inflexible moral code is more of a liability than an asset. Moody, volatile, and entirely unconcerned with conventional narrative structure, it's the sort of film you can watch as a character study, a western, a procedural, or maybe all three. Whatever it is, there really isn't anything else like it. This is someone else's movie. You know, there were other films I was thinking about, but, you know, it's it's no fun to talk about a movie when people can't have a way to see it. So some of the movies I really love, you know, it's impossible to see. Okay. And I thought, well, this is accessible enough. Um, you know, it's still in print. You can still get copies. And, and some people probably already know it, but there's not a whole lot of conversation around it. No, I was really surprised. Uh, I went looking for coverage just to, to bone up on sort of the, the tone and how people have seen it over the years. Yeah. And it just it wasn't around for most of the, the 80s and 90s. No one was even thinking about it. And then I don't think it ever had like a big... Um, you know how sometimes you can have a big push around uh, some re-release in theaters yeah. or some moment. And I think that it's suffers from the fact that James Gersey only made one movie. Yeah. You know, unless you count, he was a producer on another one. Uh, yeah, 10 years later, right? Secondhand... Secondhand Hearts, which is a... Have you seen that No, film? no, no, I've never seen it. It's it's a curiosity because on on paper, it sounds like a dream. You know, it's okay. it's James Gersey. Oh, it's uh, Robert Blake is in that with Barbara Harris. Oh. Who I adore. Um, and directed by Hal Ashby. Shot by Haskell Wexler. Okay, there's a Hal Ashby film that I don't know. <laughs> this would have been right around being there, right? Like right around that same it's, time. I think it's... Late 70s, early 80s. E- yeah, maybe even mid-70s. Yeah, it's um, it's a surprise yeah. kind of movie. And it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's one I have a hard time recommending. Um, but it's not by any means a bad movie, but mm. it's... Uh, Oh, wait, wait, wait. I do know that. Um, it was in the, of course, they mentioned it in the documentary, which I saw like a month ago. Uh, How? The, the doc about... Oh, Ashby. did they talk about it? It's in there briefly, but not, yeah, they don't really focus on it. Yeah, um, and uh, we may have focused on it more than anyone has in years. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but I mean, I think it's still worth watching because I just, I do love all those people. I don't think it's anywhere near their best work mm. for any of them. Well, but yeah, I think that, you know how it is when you have a singleton as a as a director... Yeah. Um, it's easier for your things to get lost. Yeah. And in this case, it's even weirder that, that it's sort of gotten by the wayside just because he was a record producer and Peter Cetera is in the film. Yeah. And I I had seen the movie before and it wasn't until this viewing. And it's like, oh, that's Peter Cetera from Chicago. It didn't even... Yeah. Well, land. I think like all the members of Chicago are in the film. <laughs> all the members sense. of Maduro are in the film. It's... Um, yeah, half I think half his crew was like musicians and everybody else. That would actually make sense. Yeah, and I guess it says a lot about. I mean, pretty much. I was going to ask you if you've have you listened to his audio commentary no, and his yet. introduction. Um, I mean, as I've looked for things, and other than this, I'm not sure there's a whole lot. You know, he did these things for the for the commentary of this release, but I don't know that there's a whole lot I found in terms of him talking about it. Yeah, and uh, just conversation around the film. But I think one interesting thing is, that, you know, he's a music producer. He produced all these bands. Um, it actually says a lot about how he comes into this movie, I think, because, um, you know, you think, oh, somebody just makes one film. They come into it with no film knowledge and they leave completely. Right. 
And I think with him, he his father was a projectionist, and his grandfather was a projectionist. Um, yeah, you never. I, so my <laughs> grandfather was as well. You yeah, never, you never lose it. You're you're always sort of you're cursed. With, it, with it's the, uh, and then especially if you grow up um, in that kind of atmosphere and watching movies and the kinds of movies. He was a big John Ford uh, fan, mm. and um, yeah, it it forms you. You know, it's an education, and it's uh, it's a deep one. You yeah. know, when it's your childhood, I, I never had that, but you know, I've heard people talk about it, and you hear him talking about it. You're like, okay, it's not um, it's not coming out of nowhere, and you know, he had a lot of freedom, a lot of success by that time with Chicago and other bands, and it meant that if he was going to do a movie, he had so much artistic control. Yeah. You and, know, in this other field. And this is absolutely a movie made by someone who is doing exactly what he wants. Exactly. And in such a specific like, metier almost. He's he's he has I know he referred to it as a Western in, in contemporary clothing. Yeah, and, sort know, of as I, the electroglides as uh, as horses. As horses, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the presence of Elisha Cook Junior and like all that stuff is just these are these are signifiers in their own way. Um, but it's it's if you reconfigure it as a western it's still it's too contemporary right because how many westerns are there that play like this and end like this and they're just they're they're so much more simplistic in their construction the western this one is i guess there aren't a lot of westerns except maybe the searchers or liberty valance that really interrogate the culture of the, of, in this case, the homicide detectives are the cowboys, right? They're walking around in the hats mm-hmm. and, the, and the, the boots. And they are the swag... Mitchell Ryan is the swaggering gunslinger who is convinced of everything and dead wrong of all of it. And maybe that's part of it, but there aren't... A, I, I, was, I was trying to contextualize it as a Western, so who is Blake? Is he the Jimmy Stewart character in Liberty Valance? But... No, I mean, he, he's just such a rare character at all in any yeah. kind of uh, Where drama or literature. And that question, uh, you know, there's a deep moral question that he faces and that I think the production faced because, you know, at first they couldn't get a police station. So you see a lot of their stuff is shut outdoors because, mm-hmm. you know, the police thought they were hippies and they didn't, someone, you know, got them the script and like, oh, we don't want anything to do with this. Yeah, it was going to be set in Phoenix and then they moved it to... Basically, they just went out of the, out of the city. <laughs> yeah, which makes perfect sense too because it's so desolate and lonely and... Yeah, but you, you think about it, they, they had a very different world imagined. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's from the side of, you know, the one moral side. And then the other was, you know, they played at Cannes and they hated it. Yeah, it was pilloried as a fascist work. Exactly. And so it's kind of, you know, it's you, you know you're in interesting moral territory when you're getting uh, accused of everything from yeah. all sides. Um, and I, I'm not an expert on Westerns. Um, I The ones I've seen and I've connected, they, they seem to have, you know, a spiritual element, but not this deep kind of moral conflict. And uh, like you said, something very contemporary. And I think mm-hmm. my two favorites sort of close to that genre are all in the later sort of more acid western style oh, okay you know, yeah. kind of uh the hired hand oh is, yeah the fonda yeah it's a a beautiful film that i was you know when we were talking about what film to talk i thought you know i love that movie i've seen it so many times and it's one that deepens every time i see it it's just more and more perfect every time i see it do i want to talk about that or do i want to talk about this and there is I think because this was made in such a deep personal feeling response to the confusion and uh, the horrors of Vietnam, yeah, um, it seems very present, you know, in kind of where my head is and the things I really want to feel. It also has that beautiful. I have a real soft spot for films with protagonists that are essentially good. You know, mm-hmm. they. Uh, it, they don't have to color them with these dark um, parts of the personality they're trying to conquer or dark actions. Yeah. The, his, the his, world is tricky enough. It's yeah, treacherous his, enough. His issues are with the system, not with himself. Yeah, and, and it's not that he doesn't change and he doesn't learn things throughout. It's but that you don't have to make him fundamentally flawed and that there actually is a lot of value in following someone who is essentially good. 
Mm-hmm. And in tricky situations, trying to navigate, what, how does one be good in these? It's not always obvious. And I think it's quite beautiful kind of how he moves through it. Yeah, and Blake, I mean, just casting him after In Cold Blood, which would have been just five years ago, maybe, right? Or even four, when they started making this film. I, these that things always right. amaze me. They're so they're so far back in our own history, but when you think about how they lined up with one another, yeah. and just the <laughs> fact that he has the target practice scene with the Easy Rider poster, which actually sets up the ending, of course, but you know, in, a, in a really strange... Uh, boomerangy kind of way. Um, that was 1969 or 1970. That was just part of the world he was living in right then. And for us now, I'd still, that was almost 50 years ago. It's ancient history. But yeah. we're watching the echo in the immediate, right? We're watching it. The, this film is in a dialogue with those movies in the moment, whereas right. now it just feels like it's reaching back for a reference. Right. Um, and the. Yeah, the the Ryan's speech about how everybody wants to put a bullet in you the minute you step outside, and it's either yeah he refers to the African American community, and I'm assuming that's because of Panthers in the in the seventies in California, even though this is shot in Arizona, it's written by a California guy, so that works his way in. Or now it plays like he's been watching footage on Fox, and it's a common he thinks it's a real threat because it's been hyped up around him, even though of course they didn't have any of that in 1973. It was just, that's how I relate to it now. Yeah. But it's utterly relevant to the moment. The yes. idea that the police, the white police, are gathering themselves and preparing for war when there's no threat to them. And they're creating a bigger problem by the way they interact with the community. It's very... It's What's nice is that there is no... And I think this is what he got in trouble with, is, for example, if, if you were making it today, mm-hmm. there would be all sorts of treachery, the same types of treachery. In that, you know, well, you're choosing a story sympathetic to a policeman. Yeah. Sure, that can be seen as, as problematic. Sure. Is it a real threat? These, uh, this was based on a, uh, a, a real news story at the time. So it's kind of like, well, that was real. Mm-hmm. But that isn't, is hardly the end of the story. And the fact that it's just the beginning of... Suspicion, um, abuse of power, uh, fear, yeah, um, and a big part is just the things you want, the dream you're trying to live. It's it's amazing how everybody is just on this trajectory to kind of over, achieve something, overcome some kind of loneliness, you know, mm-hmm. um, and the things that get in the way, you know, how you deal with that devastation is uh is so american to me yeah um and yeah i I think it 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 would have just as hard a time today yeah as i think it did then um because it will do something that i don't want to say you won't like but you may not be expecting yeah well Um, so much of it is it's not transgressive exactly, but it goes right up against the expectations of the genre in a way that is off-putting until it writes itself, until it tells you what it is. You know, like that first hour where we are trying to figure out where we stand in the landscape, both morally and, and narratively. You know, like, is this guy going to turn? Is he a criminal? Is he going along to get along? Or is he going to stand up? And then it turns out that it's none of those things. That's not what this movie's mm-hmm. about. It's about him figuring out who he wants to be. And it's the... It's the disillusionment, it's the aspirational stuff, the, the, the disappointment with the American dream where you get your success and it's nothing that you wanted. Uh, and, yeah. And Blake doesn't respond to any of it. He's the one with the poker face for almost you know, 90 minutes of the movie before he starts to act. There are... Well, or he, he pushes back in ways that aren't kind of movie narrative yeah. kind of moves. You know, it's not like he becomes the a whistleblower in the system or something. Right. He's the type of person who he sees an action that's wrong and he pushes back. But only to a degree because he sees his partner who he has to see every day. He understands that he can only push so far um, yeah. to do this, what you call getting along. And it's sort of, that's a complex question. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, if you pretend it's an easy one, I don't think you'll ever have the world you want or you imagine because a lot of people deal with this. A lot of people know what the right thing is 
and they may have the courage to do a little towards it, but to become a huge catalyst for yeah. it is, is rare. And I think it's a very realistic picture of he's definitely the more sympathetic one, but he's also not uh, the one you can get around, uh, get behind and say, you know, this is this is the white hat. Yeah. The one time he really loses his temper is when he's yelling at a coroner who uh, <laughs> is willing to write off a suspicious death. Which, <laughs> you know, every time I watch that scene with Royal Dano, yeah. um, it's just it's so funny. <laughs> it really is. And I and I think that that so much of the movie is so funny. And it's mixed in there with, you know, you're you're at a crime scene. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh it's not that they're both raising their voices, it's that as soon as Ryan shows up, Dano just starts yelling at him too because he's still <laughs> mad, which is so Exactly. And, well, but he's also a, it's a beautiful I think that that's the thing I love about the filmmaker's perspective. Mm-hmm. It's like that's that is those are natural patterns yeah in life you know things spill over as opposed to neat line kind of filmmaking and i think that that's what makes this so rich and you'll take these huge detours that aren't really detours but they feel like it because that's not what normal movies do like when you know um harvey and johnny wintergreen go to the bar and jolene is there yeah which is again just such a a strange character dynamic already. Yeah. Which, which, you know, it's like the rest of the film, which is a bit of a mystery. You're not quite sure what the relationships are. Yeah. But boy, do they become clear. Yes. In that scene. And it's suddenly, you know, this, this woman who, um, at the beginning is shown in this very kind of as a play thing, you know, you're like, okay, maybe we're in that kind of seventies movie. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, no, she, we're just going to we're going to put this whole murder business to the side and it's going to be about her yeah and it's going to be about her dreams and all these things on these pictures on the wall that you might you you didn't notice before and it's just one of the most beautiful things for that surprise yeah. uh, for that heart how much it loves that character yeah it's a really uncomfortable moment in the narrative yeah because the revelation that she's a mutual factor between uh, John and and, I can and Harvey, Harvey, yeah, yeah I can, John and Harvey. Uh, that is a huge complication to everything that we've been watching in terms of the procedural. But yeah, it's a it's about her and how she feels and how she's allowed to be completely in control of that scene. And these two guys have guns. Yeah, and she's <laughs> just not taking any of their shit she is just she's allowing herself to be seductive and taunting and angry and sexy in that power and deeply vulnerable yeah there's something going on that only she understands and we get to see it you know that that scene to me is as that monologue is as beautiful and as deep as anything that martha has in who's afraid of virginia do you (laughs) know what i mean that's a really good point of comparison i i think of them as very similar and you know, you look at, there's sort of like three dreams dying simultaneously yeah. in, in that scene, you know, so there's, she's reliving hers. And, uh, and, and it seems so simple in construction, but how heartbreaking, you know, it's, it's like, okay, she, and it's, it feels so American in this storytelling too. It's yeah. like, she meets a salesman. She falls in love. He wanted children. She wanted to go to Hollywood. She pursued her dreams. She never got there. She lost everything. Yeah. It's so simple. But the how of you telling it, and with, oh my God, um, uh, Janine Riley is, is unbelievable. Yeah, and she's in, what, her late 20s? I, I was surprised to find out. <laughs> I checked. She was born in 1945, and she's playing at least 10 years older. Yeah, um, I didn't know that. But she's owning it. I mean, she she's... The really is. Hilarious. And like you said, so in control and and bouncing all around in... in She can be... She can have the claws out and tear into Harvey in one moment. Mm. But then when he becomes aggressive and is, you know, and she sees that you know, as many things he cannot follow through. Oh, yeah. 
it, it almost becomes very moving how she takes care of him. Yeah, she pities him in the moment. It really does. But then that changes a second later. <laughs> yeah. Such whiplash. It is, uh, it is great that... I mean, it's great that the film trusts us to trust her in a weird way, that it just lingers without any commentary. There's not yeah. a lot of... This is a movie that doesn't tell you how to feel about anything. Mm-hmm. You're just watching it all happen in these big, long, gorgeous Conrad Hall compositions. And, yeah. and we just watch these people go at each other. The scene, I mean, the scene with the coroner, the scene, uh, the book ending of the scenes with, um, with, uh, with Cook, where he's incoherent. And, you know, yes. First he's incoherent in anger, and then he's incoherent in grief uh-huh. at the end. And just the way that, that Blake is so still for so much of it he's just letting things happen around him and taking it in and observing even the scenes you know every scene where every traffic stop where he's just behind sunglasses and not portraying anything not allowing any emotion to come through and just watching while zipper does something either ill-advised or outright stupid yeah or while he's talking to somebody and trying to you know like uh, let me give you a piece of advice what was it i'm going to tell you something in six that took me six months oh for someone to tell me yeah i'm gonna gonna do you a favor and it's just so cold (laughs) but it's not wrong yeah like he's he's in the scene with and we come back to the scene with the bar with jolene where he is just observing because he's afraid to... A lot of it is... I mean, he himself is in a point of life where he's trying to make decisions. You know, he has ambitions. He's trying to figure out how to get where he wants to get. Mm-hmm. That scene is is devastating for him because he realizes, you know, Harvey was his ticket. Yeah. This was going to go well. He was going to help solve this murder. And he was going to become a detective. And now he sees, like, that's dead. Yeah. Dead through an accident. You know, it's not that... That wasn't one of the things Jolene lashed out about. She... Uh, she, she even says, you weren't supposed to hear that, Harvey. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, and then, you know, I, I don't, I just think Harvey is not the kind of person who's been skewered like that publicly. It's, you know, he privately may feel these things. Yeah, and he, he, he feels, yeah, but. He could never publicly. have someone who works for him know that about him. So, oh, the pain in there. And, the, and it's, and you weren't expecting it. And you also, maybe it takes you a while to catch up to realizing the triangle and what it means for each of those. Sure, yeah. Each of those people, yeah. And then just the next day in the interrogation scene where he just directs it all at Wintergreen because, of course he would, because he's not mature enough to handle any of the stuff he's still angry about and turns on John and forces him out. And it's like, there you go, just in case you were hoping this was going to blow over. Yeah. It's never going away. I mean, I'm curious because there is, that's around the time... Um, you know, the woman who comes in who says, you know, I know Bob Zimico and uh, there was much more to her story. They were behind and they had to cut like 10 pages or something. Oh, really? And so her story went out the window. There was a little more with her and um, and James Garcia referred to it as a romance. So I don't know if they started something that there was even a little more I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. He, there. Yeah, Wintergreen is definitely at least in his own mind, he's a ladies' man. Yeah. Uh, the scene at the the ice cream truck where he's just flirting, <laughs> and it's it's so great because the two those two young women uh, who I've never seen before, I don't think in anything, they're completely fresh to me. As they, one was James Garcia's wife. Ah, there you go. And her friend. <laughs> okay. And I'm assuming the wife is the one who's receptive. I think the wife is the older one. There's oh, one okay. who's quite young. Yeah. And, then and the I younger that that one is the, the one he wins over, and yeah. we get to watch. That's so, those scenes are so that that scene those shots are so great because we get to watch him flirting successfully while someone else isn't realizing what he's doing and <laughs> and she, the older friend just isn't buying it she's tired she doesn't like she's sick of him in five seconds she doesn't want this to go on yeah and then the younger one starts to kind of laugh and he sees the opening and we you get a sense of who this guy is and how he operates and how because we're repeatedly reminded in the first real that he's short he's ill-suited to this job he's yeah. not the right guy for this thing this persona that's larger than life that he wants so badly to wear and then in these scenes you get to see oh no he could make it work for him like he he jumps in with acknowledging how he's short and <laughs> talks about alan ladd yeah i think the alan ladd line was probably the only one that was scripted in there and okay. everything else was improvised and i think that that is the mark of how good this movie is because it does so many things well that I'm usually very suspicious of. <laughs> I'm very suspicious of improvised scenes. I'm very suspicious of, for example, the the um, 
the scene we were talking about with Jolene in the bar, mm-hmm. you know, there is a lot of cutting in that scene. Yeah. And uh, which I usually don't like for those really big dramatic moments and especially cutting to reactions of the two men. But it's... Yeah. Oh, but it they're works essential so well. in this case. You need to see Harvey's face. It, it, they're so judiciously done. And also, you know, the, it ends with a scene where how many times have we seen it before where people, you know, throw glassware around yeah. and clear off. But there is something, if you watch that gesture, and I'm sure if you watch it next to every other kind of time that gesture comes up in movies, mm-hmm. there's something so different about it. And it, I credit a lot of the actor, um, how quickly she does it mm-hmm. and how it's an extension of a thought as opposed to a thing you're told to do. Yeah. Um, well, and we don't see her face, which makes it right. really powerful. Because yeah. she could be weeping, she could be very still, she could be angry. There are a million different expressions that could be on her face, and because we can't see any of them, we just look even closer. Just that thing where you protect a part of the performance or you hide a part of the character, a facet mm-hmm. that we can't, ac- we can't access, that becomes ten times, a hundred times more fascinating. And... Because I, she's being destructive, we, yeah. don't, we don't fully get the impulse. And you know, I I suspect he when in the commentary, which it, basically that's all this conversation is, is I'm standing in you're, and I'm reciting his commentary. So much further. <laughs> I love it when people do their research. And like, it's it's heartbreaking because like that's all there is. <laughs> it's a, um, he talks about it as a, as one take, okay. um, not that they did one take. Sorry, as a, as a single take, and. I think what it, he means is that her performance was uh, it was constructed that way and it was played out that way, even though there are all these other inserts and everything else. And I think that that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about even a scene where you have coverage. Yeah. To go in understanding that I need a whole thing and that there's certain elements of performance that won't come out. Like, maybe I, I could be completely wrong since this is a guess, but, you know, something like the glassware, if that is just done in isolation, I think, I think it could be kind of ridiculous. Maybe it was done that way and it still reads wonderfully. But yeah. I, if not that, other pieces, I think, benefit so much from it having been part of a whole, even before they, they cut it up. Yeah. That they felt it as a whole. They understood it as a whole. And they, therefore, they could respect it that way and understand how to cut in uh, the inserts and everything else. Yeah. Well, I mean, in musical terms, it's the crescendo. It's the it's the final. It's the thing that gets you out of the song or the scene. That's yeah. that's where she can give nothing else. It's if it was a musical, this is where she'd start singing. Like she would. She's words failed. Words have failed her, and this it's is what she can. It's so do. interesting you say that because I mean, music is a big deal in this because James Garcia wrote a lot of music. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, she starts off, she, she hits the jukebox and they start dancing. Yeah. And she ends the scene dancing with no music. Yeah, alone and angry. And, again, uh, I'll put my commentary hat on. Please. He says that, you know, they had music when she was shooting the scene so that she could move to it. Oh, okay. And then he liked it without it. And I, I, I can't imagine it any other way. It's really tense. <laughs> yeah, well, we, I mean, it's, it's, it's that thing that... Again, it pulls the back of the brain because she's doing something that isn't out of context a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit. Yeah. Because we've all seen people sway in bars. That's yeah. that's a drunk thing, that's a song thing. And here there's none of there's no context for it. It's just the thing she starts to do. And it's unnerving and then it releases itself in the in the clearing of the bar. But yeah, if that's the anger building up inside of her physically, it's a really interesting way to express it, even yeah. if that wasn't the original intent. There are, you know, I'm glad we focused on that one scene because I, I, I think it's such an achievement for the movie. And then the other one is um, after the concert, the one I, you know, and these are both sort of monologue, those kind of middle of night yeah. moments, um, you know, where he's talking to the custodian. Mm-hmm. Talking and, about his, specifically about how his father died of loneliness. Yeah. And, you know, there's something he says in there that kind of just washed over me the first couple times I, I, I saw it. I didn't really think too much about it, where he talks about, you know, what you're doing now, sweeping the floor, yeah. eating your sandwich, is more important than 90% of the things I do. 
And at first, I, you know, you hear that and you're like, oh, is that just some sort of, you know, working person romance kind of things? But then I, the thing I missed is what he said, which is he said, it's because you're listening to yourself yeah. at those times. And that, that has really fascinated me in, in these, uh, since I, I recognize that, mm -hmm. because what is he saying? You know, you're listening to yourself. When you listen to yourself, it's not that you're lecturing yourself. You're not telling yourself something or, you know, so it's, it's an expression for considering, yeah. you know, the things you know already and what they mean. Uh, and it's fundamentally a question. And it's amazing that that he can solve a mystery, <laughs> you know, he can solve a murder, uh, with that kind of silence and that space for consideration and yeah. self-reflection. I was trying to figure out if you, if it's some sort of an attempt at an early attempt rather at expressing the concept we have now of being present and being in the moment because a custodian sweeping up would have to look and pay attention and, you know, be really focused on what you're doing mm -hmm. in order to clean, in order to find the, the litter in order to pick up the pieces. But I don't think that's what it is. That right. was just my first interpretation. Right, right. It's like, is that what this is now? Is this a, because that way, does that extend to him being able to solve the murder because he connects it to his lo to his father's loneliness and his feelings about that? Is, is it because only through drawing on your own history can you understand what you're seeing in front of you? And I don't, I don't think it is. I think your take on it is more It apt. is, yeah, it is this... Um, because a, a pre pre being present means that you have more... You, you know, you're kind of connected to the, to the stimuli of the moment. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's quite... It. It's almost the opposite. It's like we've had a lot of stimuli. How do we make sense of it? Yeah, you recede into yourself to figure out what it means. Essentially, the, our internal conversation, which um, needs a kind of silence or boredom or space to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it strikes me very much because of the type of world we're in where everything is working to fill that and monetize that space. Oh, yeah. You know that that is a precious place where we learn who we are, who we consider who we are. There's a, there's a passage in, in Tolstoy where he's talking about Prince Vasily, you know, and uh, he, he talks about how you know, he, did, he didn't consider his actions, really. He just moved through the world. He was successful. He made a habit of that success. He didn't think of, you know, doing harm to others just, just so that he could benefit. Um, he just made a habit of this success. He did things, and he did things, and he was planning. And, and eventually, it just becomes the whole of his life. And he never considers it without realizing it. That's what happens. Mm. And I think that this is sort of talking about the flip side of that kind of life what that life is missing, that kind of consideration. And I think that that's, to me, what makes him a hero. That's what makes him worth the tragedy, you know, or that great things don't come to somebody like this with an awareness, with a conscience, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, of course, being conscientious is the thing he ultimately shouldn't do at the very... I mean, that's... When he is, the dog is snoring for anyone who's listening. Uh, <laughs> it's very soothing. Um, but when he ultimately, finally, fully formed, confronts everyone, like he, he, there's a switch inside of him that that flips about ninety minutes into the movie, where mm -hmm. uh, John simply starts to act and confront and tell people when they're wrong and tell people uh, and and push against the oppressive command structure and, and accepts that he's going to be a motorcycle cop, but that also means killing Zipper because Zipper has also transgressed and he doesn't let it go. He immediately doesn't... He calls him out on it. The finger gesture that runs throughout the movie where he points at the thing yeah. that has fixed it, that he's fixed upon, and it's the motorcycle, and Zipper confesses about the money, and then there's that whole elaborate, almost seizure sort of thing he goes through and Billy Greenbush just he's way way over the top but it also sort of makes sense given how badly banged up we've seen him be and mm -hmm. maybe this is some sort of brain damage maybe this is just his own inability to, to uh, exist within this world coming out and he just he loses it completely starts firing randomly yeah. he probably kills someone else and is killed himself and it's just all of these things are because John can't say 
oh yeah, whatever. He can't let it go. He he has to call him out. Yeah, and that he's he still has a conscious. It's not like oh I don't have a dream anymore, so screw the world. Yeah. It's it he can't let go of um, the sense of when things are wrong of calling them out. They also are in much more desperate times. You yes. know, Johnny's not acting like it and at that moment, but having seen what he's gone through and what his, his dreams kind of dashed, we know that about him. And then for Zipper, you know, you have to kind of do a little work to figure out exactly yeah, where he's coming his from. state of mind. But then you think it's actually, a, I, I see it as a parallel to, um, to Willie, is that, yeah. you know, it's a, it's, it was a betrayal from Johnny. And it's that sense of loneliness. You know, that was his guy, yeah. his companion. And to have him finally really step up in a way he hadn't done. Like, you know, he let Zipper do, you know, abuse people. Even though he pushed back, he let it happen. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't about to let Zipper do this one thing, which was almost kill Peter Sotero. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that um, completely changed history as we know it. <laughs> Peter Cetera. But the other people do die and die badly in that chase, which which I had forgotten second time through watching it again just just last night to catch up to it again. It's like, yeah. oh, that's right. These are the the stunts aren't shot just to to digress for a second into the the way this thing shoots the motorcycle chase, which as yeah. I understand it was the big appeal at the time that this centerpiece chase was the thing people talked about. Really? When the film was out there. That's that was a good how chase. it was sold. On its, <laughs> it is. It was sold on its stunts, but it's really brutal and it's not in any way thrilling or there's no vis, there's there's a lot of a visceral pull to it, but there's mm. no there's no enjoyment for us. We get to watch people fall off their bikes and get run over after yeah. they fall off their bikes. It's real I mean it's obviously a dummy, but it's a brutal death for this one character who we never really get to know. Yeah. And it's all because Zipper wants to shoot at him. And he opens fire. I mean, imagine now, imagine any movie where a police officer opens fire on a public street in the middle of a car chase. We just, we don't see that. It's always provoked. You know, they have to be shot at before. They're, they're all, movies have now made it so that you cannot have a, unless the cop is the villain. Mm-hmm. You don't do this in a civilian area. It's just not done. It wasn't done that often in the 70s movies either, as far as I can tell. Yeah. And it's really it's a, a great chase because it doesn't follow any rule that we understand. It's got weird slow motion flips and stunts and um, the, the, the stakes are really low, but then people start dying and it becomes <laughs> really, really escalated really yeah. quickly. I mean, it, it is a, an unusual, I, I remember, I, and I still don't think too much about it. Mm. Um, you know, I, I see it a little. I try to see if I can pick out stylistic things because it was Conrad Schall didn't shoot that. It was a it was second a, unit. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was post, right? It, this is the other thing I know about the much film. It was later. shot afterwards yeah. to give the movie. Some it was it was shot much action. later. Um, and then uh, talking about violence, the part that I know was changed. So they, you know, uh, James Garcia had a lot of freedom from the studio um, because that's the only way he would make the movie. Mm-hmm. But they didn't make him change one thing. And that had to do with violence. And that's the way Johnny Wintergreen dies uh, at the end. Okay. Um, in, uh, it was more violent. There's something cut out of that sequence that was more violent. Just another shot? Another... I guess so. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, it's in the middle somewhere there. We're missing a little something. Hmm. Um, but I'm curious, but in the end, it's... You know, you're you're too floored by the final shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need. I mean, it needs to marinate the way it does, and also just the fact that the credits don't roll for a good Quite three a minutes. It's really something. You just sort yeah. of sit there and and steep in it while it's happening, and, and the camera slows down, and the bird is frozen that in the frame, bird. and you just you're left with it. I saw. I finally got to see a print projected oh, uh, wow. last summer. And yeah, that bird feels so much bigger than life on a <laughs> Yeah, it's, and it's very funny because uh, Conrad Hall didn't want to, really didn't care to shoot in Monument Valley. He wasn't very excited about the exteriors. But then when he got there, yeah. he was like, oh, yeah, I got this. <laughs> it is, and he got very excited. Oh, it's gorgeous. There's a beaut in every shot. It's just, <laughs> it's so, um, it, is, it is, you know, it's quintessential Western imagery, but it's so mm-hmm. powerful to see it 
contemporized. It's so powerful to see people in modern dress in those spaces because yeah. that's just not what my brain expects when I see those landscapes. Uh, but yeah, but to to get back to Zipper, um, starting this the massive car chase out of or car and, and bike chase out of spite, really, just because he thinks he's right. And every single police action in the film up to that point has been wrong, which I find fascinating. All the harassment, all the raids, yeah. there isn't a single piece of connective tissue to the original murder. They're all just chasing leads that don't pan out. That's interesting. And I was, when, you, when you first said that, I wasn't thinking about the murder. I was thinking about, I think what is very interesting about Johnny at the very beginning is you remember he gives... A ticket. Oh, the traffic stop. That's yeah. That's yeah. Those are all reg- but that, all that I think that says so much about him is that he's not bending the rules for yeah, a detective, a, for some- <laughs> a detective, a fellow veteran. Yeah, right? like he's that's that's the Western thing. The guy who can't be bought. The guy who won't, yeah. who won't be broken. Yeah, but who and who is for a while at least really we watch him consider throwing all that away to compromise himself to join homicide. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Except that he's right. So that makes it okay that he's not really giving anything up. And then there's, then it's all, it all comes back to that action where he kicks Zipper's motorcycle over because finally he won't let this happen. Even though yeah. Zipper's already shot a guy. He's, he's not letting him shoot the next guy. Yeah. But that is, you know, when you brought it up before that he, um, you know, even before he kicks the bike, when he was, actually this is after he kicks the bike. So he still is... Um, when, Zip, when he sees that Zipper has taken the money. Yeah. The um, righteousness comes back up again. It it does. And I think that that's what's very useful. And, and I think what, as far as a moral journey, um, is that it's just not in one direction. Mm-hmm. And I think that there is, you know, what I find, there's a lot of disillusionment that uh, obviously comes from loss of dreams and what happened in the Vietnam War. But I also what I see is very American is there's an optimism, um, and there is a virtue, and it's that sense that you know we may not know how to execute it in a consistent way, in a way that lets our lives lead to something, but there is this spark in people that wants to do the right thing, mm-hmm. that is good, that may not know how strongly to assert itself at times that may come out in this, you know, haphazard way, but it's there, you know, and it, it makes all these people redeemable. Everyone shows some sort of kindness and charm um, and beauty, uh, both in their good moments and in their lows. Uh, and I think that that's what's so extraordinary. And I think why I connect to it in sort of this moment in history Yeah is you know there's so much disillusionment with many things but there are also these sparks that i still see in people that i still see around the system um that i you know even for the tragic end in this for some reason i still feel like what i remember is not you know there's kinds of tragedy where you just can't move because because you you can't find a reason to after that sure and then this is shocking but strangely inspiring. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he... It, it's a small decision. He's going to return somebody's license. Yeah. And it's not noble, exactly, but it is the job. And it's the thing that he has been railing against. It's. I mean, you can see it as the acceptance of, of his fate to be a highway patrolman, and that's the thing that, as soon as he fulfills that, as mm-hmm. soon as he accepts that there's no reason to keep living, and so... You know, drama kills him. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the tragic. It's an ironic end. He does someone a kindness, and that lets him go. Realizes he has to go catch him again. Yeah, and that's what gets him killed. But it's also the yeah. It's the it's the the feeling of an ending. The feeling of the film having nothing else to do. So it's time. Well, you know, maybe maybe the reason you you, you kind of clued me in on something because what what is very striking about that ending one of the things is that it's very unjust Mm -hmm. and it kind of hits that spark in you and it's not and i guess most people i think would respond not oh that's so unjust you know let's not do anything (laughs) let's give up on the world Yeah, yeah it's kind of that spark of let's unjust let's not do this let's 
change. Let's let's move towards a more just uh, outcome. Yeah. And I think that that's such a useful use of tragedy um, and this type of le- moving through someone's life like that. Yeah. yeah, just the sense that he is a lesson to, well, to no one in the movie. The world of the film will uh-huh. never understand what happened. Those people will just find yeah. his body and they'll never know what killed, who killed him or why he died. Yeah. But, or maybe they will because he still has a license on him and that might actually, you know, there could be a, <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to radiate outwards, but all of it is irrelevant because it's ultimately about what we take out as the audience because that's what this is for. Right. Or that's who this is for. And it's just, uh, yeah, I, I don't understand how this film could be seen as fascist. I mean, by the French, sure. They'll see anything American in, during Vietnam as fascist. But the, 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 the problem with the, the, the problem with the film is so concerned with the rot inside of police and uh-huh. the authority, the abuse of authority that we see throughout the film that it's a critique of fascism at best. I think so. But I think the thing that would, I think it would still be, its reception would be quite confused today. Sure. And I think that the people who would most confuse it would be the people who are looking for um, clean statements mm-hmm. about this or that, or looking for, um, you know, villains or heroes in this or that. And I think that it gives you none of those things. Um, and it doesn't give it to you in just, it doesn't substitute ambiguity. Uh, it actually s- substitutes, I think, uh, real depth yeah. and the complexity of life yeah. and of human behavior that is um, you know and it's and it's just very hard you can we can sit here and I can hit someone can apply those words to a, a drama that I think is ridiculous that doesn't do anything at all um, but you know in what we were talking about for example in the Jolene Barr scene uh, about the complications of how much is spi- simultaneously happening all at once mm-hmm. um it's there's something going on here that is so full and i think that that's why i love the movie so much and why i can watch it so much um so full it it hits real patterns of behavior and truth that lets you you were talking about radiating outwards in story Mm -hmm. but radiating outwards in meaning um like in our own lives when we think about important events and defining things they start to gather meaning the more we reflect on them uh, because they're key points. And I think that when you tell a drama where you align a lot of these key points, uh, it can do that. You keep going back and you keep accumulating all this understanding of what it can teach you um, and what it's showing you about the world. Yeah, we know by the end of this film, we know where everyone has come from and where most of them are going. Um, But we don't need to stay with them. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can when when John is dead, the movie is over. The, like his narrative is done, and so we literally leave him. We pull away uh-huh. and only go so far because, well, yeah, there's nowhere else to go for the story. Yeah, but there is other things. Like there's so much else happening. Right, um, and and then in our you know our understanding doesn't stop there, and then that's that's to show you even though it seems like a procedural, you know, as a mystery at times, um, it is much more because. Yeah, our our understanding and our thinking about it uh, hopefully doesn't stop there. Yeah, and it can keep affecting us, and we can keep wondering about again, like things in life. You know, events end, but they stay with us. Um, and this movie really stays with me. Uh, in in these wonderful characters. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk too much about Elijah Cook's character. Yeah. Um, but what a wonderful thing for him to be in. I know that. Uh, James Garcia really loved him and working with Roy Dano. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're incredible, iconic presences yeah. by the seventies. I mean, they've made what dozens of films each yeah. by that point, and and Cook is effectively playing the same kind of grizzled prospector character he played in a dozen westerns, yeah. just in a contemporary setting. But just the idea that he's halfway between a hermit and. Uh, uh, whatever else he's doing I mean we never really understand who he or what he does we know who he is he goes yeah. up on Superstition Mountain and then he comes down and hangs out with Frank and he goes back up on the mountain for two or three months but what's he doing well, I, there? What's, I never what's thought about it this way but 
as you were just describing that, mm -hmm. he almost plays the role of, you know, kind of what a classical fool is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he is sort of, he is probably as American an element, as much a, a cipher for the American soul as, as anything mm. in this. Um, yeah. I was also trying to figure out this time if we're supposed to read him and Frank as having been lovers. So they, he refers to him um, when they first got together in 1942. Uh -huh. And I'm assuming it's an army buddy situation. I think that's how it's supposed to read. Uh -huh. But it's also, you know, it could be a 30-year relationship. There's no reason to discount it yeah. just because the film doesn't explicitly identify it. But it's one of those moments where it's just like, is that why he's so upset? Is was he always mad, or is he is this who he is now because he's killed his this thirty year relationship that he's actually destroyed physically by killing him? Is that yeah. something we should think about? And is, is that how it's being played? And I don't think it is, but it, I love the possibility. You know, there is uh, there are little bits like that where you're like, huh? <laughs> yeah. what, what exactly is that hinting at? But I I think I like that you brought it up because it. It reminds me of the range of behavior. I mean, we, there's no shortage of scenes between men in movies, but mm. something that actually looks at the dynamic between men um, who are friends, who are competitors, who are all these things is is really rich yeah. in this film. And it's a big part of almost every relationship. Yeah. Really. I mean, even Jolene in the end is, is undone by a, a relationship, a dynamic between two men. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, there's a lot of, I mean, just the fact that comic books keep recurring to the, this illusion of, you know, overgrown boys mm -hmm. uh, who've become police or, or figures of authority too, because there's somebody at the home who, who slaps Frank when he finds out, uh, or not Frank, slaps uh, Alicia Cook's character, uh, yeah. um, slaps him with a comic when he finds out he's been hiding it all along. Yeah. It's, it's a really strange factor uh, comic books were not read by grown men in 1973. It just wasn't a thing. It was dismissed as kid stuff. And it stood out to me now just thinking, because they talk about Wonder Woman and Plastic Man and all these, those are real. They haven't licensed them. They were just yeah. around, presumably. <laughs> but it's one of those things that's like really stands out almost 40 years later that that was not a thing that would be thrown around casually. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think that might have been... Uh something Billy Bush wanted for his character. That would make sense. Um, yeah. Do you, you mentioned something about the writer. You know, it's, I, I have, I know this movie mm -hmm. and I know very little radiating out from it. So you just rewatched this? Yeah, last night. I yeah? just pulled it out and watched it again, <laughs> just on there. And uh, it's very fresh for me. It had been, it's probably been 15 years since I saw it last. I, I would have first seen it complete on uh, when, the, when MGM's DVD came out, so 2002, okay. 2003, I would say. I had seen, before we started rolling, we, we talked about this a little bit, I had seen bits of it on television, uh -huh. probably in the late 80s, and all I remember was thinking that it was kind of stiff, mm -hmm. because presumably the pan and scan would have been monstrous yeah. uh, on the scope imagery, but also because I, I somehow in my head I thought it was either adult, uh, more adult themed or actual pornography uh -huh. I'm not sure but the title I remember being sold as sort of I have this vague memory of a TV commercial with a woman's voice saying electric light and blue and not <laughs> understanding it because it would have been I would have been six uh -huh. uh, five or six when it came out and in the back of my head for the longest time I thought it was it was just something that wasn't for um uh, something I don't even know what the term is I don't I don't know that I thought it was porn but I thought it was mature uh -huh. In a way that, and and then it opened. I remember watching it from in in two thousand two in the DVD, and then it opens with sex scene, uh -huh. and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, this is this is an adult film. It's about, I guess, it's about their relationship, and then it's so not that. Yeah, it um, it does trick you. It's yeah. um, you know, well, first it there's almost a, a palate cleanser that you don't quite uh, know what to make of. Um, where, you know, they show you the close-ups of the murder mm -hmm. and set everything up, and then they go into the exteriors, and then and then you're right. The real first, real scene we get where we actually see people and come to know them, um, it feels 
to me, I, I've, I've started to see that as, you know, that's kind of an adolescence. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you're a little sex crazed and, you know, playful and think, but it's also, um, you know, and Robert Blake is working out and it's kind of, yeah. it's, uh, it's very physical. It, but to me, it also feels like it, you know, where it's kind of, that's adolescence and then everything else is sort of aftermath, it is growing up, mm-hmm. um, you know, because in that scene, there's, there's joy and there's dreams and everything is possible. And then they grow up in the rest of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the consequences of his childish actions, ultimately, if you want to, if you want to mm-hmm. take it to the logical end, is that the thing you do when you're a kid and you don't understand consequence mm-hmm. is the thing that undoes his professional aspirations because he's slept with the boss's girl and didn't know it. Wasn't, mm-hmm. wasn't doing it to hurt anybody. It was an unconscious act or an un, a completely unaware act. He was ignorant mm-hmm. of it. And simply by following his, his lust, he's ruined his, his adulthood. Yeah, there's a, you know, I, there's something I, I mean to pay more attention to. And I'm not, sh- I'm not sure if it's even really in the movie. But, you know, we know that in that bar scene with, um, with Johnny... Uh, Harvey and Jolene, you know, obviously he understands everything that's happening there. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much he sees that coming from, because obviously when he's seeing Jolene, he doesn't know that the other person is Harvey. Right. I think. I I I don't think so. That's right. There's no indication. Yeah. And then, so I'm wondering when, because, you know, there's a scene when they're in the bar again earlier Mm -hmm. when she's interacting with him in you know um in a flirtatious way with harvey and you know he's kind of the I, i'm you know he's obviously knows all these people i'm just wondering how much he knew oh is he putting it like, together in the is, moment? was he putting together in that moment or yeah. yeah i'm just wondering if there were other places where he knew or had indications beforehand i wonder i didn't think so i mean it doesn't yeah. feel like it feels like Jolene is flirting with Harvey the way she'd flirt with any customer. Yeah. It's really casual and uh-huh. it's not. There's no sense of history between them. Uh, or maybe that's just how we're supposed to see it. Yeah. And Joan is already twigging it. You should probably watch it again. <laughs> it's not the worst thing I could do. <laughs> but, yeah, just the fact that it leaves room for those interpretations, is there, there's a depth to this film that I, I really... I'm, I'm delighted to find is still there. Yeah. Um, and it holds up to repeat viewings and it's... It's so completely of its time, but it also feels utterly relevant now. I mean, I suppose that's the, the whole update of the Western thing. The morality, the, the question of a man's morality never changes. That's always going to be the core of drama, especially if you're dealing with a system, whether it's cowboys or police. Yeah. How, how one man can function within a larger um, hierarchy of men. I mean, it's Deadwood, it's The Wire, it's it's everything. It, mm-hmm. It's, it's an, an endless dramatic uh um launching pad yeah it um it and does gender, feel very, very it does feel very now uh politically personally um and i i just love how it extends we have you know so many things that's like you know the the mystery element of it you know is it could so easily be very hokey yeah but sure how it executes it is so beautiful and it's a it's a really wonderful lesson the whole movie in the how of execution and how you know we've been applying all these words to it that in some ways are cheap words you know we say them about a lot of movies but the how of this movie executing those ideas uh those principles is is has a rare uh, purity Mm. to it that I, I wonder if it could only really come from an outsider yeah. um, who is uh, kind of investing everything and doesn't know if they get to do it again, um, is experiencing such joy in the making of it. I mean, I feel like exec- it, I, I could be applying this to the other film we were talking about, The Hired Hand, yeah. um, which is a mixture of kind of this young perspective and a lot of old masters kind of orbiting them um, and contributing. I mean, if you want to recommend it to people, I am perfectly happy to like, give you the time to do it. It's, <laughs> uh, it has just been reissued on Blu-ray, I think. Uh, it was it came out maybe last year. I was surprised to see that uh, the rights had changed hands, and there's a new um, uh, there's a new restoration. I think 
I want to say it's a, there's a 4K restoration that made it out onto disc last year. It might only be 2K. That but would make sense because I saw it in theaters on. Uh, they had played it again, and it was a uh, a, a digital. DCP, it yeah. was a DCP, yeah. Which um, I think I've, I've been very lucky. I've seen it on print three times, the hired hand, and well. it's uh, yeah, it's gorgeous, and it's 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 really do that they. Um, they should re-release it because the DVD is terrible. There's mm. a lot of dissolves in that, and the uh, the DVD technology and that they the coding they had, especially at the time, was horrible. Yeah, I think uh, I remember that. I remember it looking just it was it's it's clearly a post production thing that they've done now instead of in the seventies to finish some. It was around two thousand one or so that yeah. they that they put out that DVD. I think. Yeah, I remember it. And it was. Uh, you know, I do think it, you know, at the time I struggled, like, do I tell people to watch it, even though there's all these losses? And, and I still think it was worth it. But I'm very happy to hear now that there's another home video option that is higher quality. Yeah, I'll find all the specifics and add it to the end of the, uh, <laughs> the episode so people will know where to find it. Uh, but it's, but speaking of, of the end, before we, we do wrap, I kind of want to ask the, the obvious weird question of the Robert Blake of it all. Um, yeah. It is still kind of strange to me watching him and appreciating his performances, knowing where his life ends up, where his, like, what happens. Uh, and I'm, it's that weird, we're in the Me Too era right now where, well, it's, it, it's a different issue, but, you know, this guy probably murdered his wife and, and had, or had her killed and, and all of these things are in his future. And I, I, I just find it difficult to talk about the movie without acknowledging that it is now sort of post facto tainted by the things that came later the yeah. casting of Robert Blake as an upright man is retroactively problematic I guess and it's you don't need to have an opinion on this or anything yeah. it's just something it's one of those little things that, that pulls on me now when you know we're recording this a week after the Oscars where I just watch people thank everyone involved with Bohemian Rhapsody except Brian Singer and it's one of those strange things that traps us in time yeah and this film 50 years later is uh is still tremendously watchable and my only take on it is that it's just i'm angry at blake for not being the person i want him to be which is just a decent human being i mm -hmm. guess and making it difficult making it slightly difficult really to appreciate because i can compartmentalize like crazy <laughs> i'm very good at that yeah um I've done two Polanski episodes and you know, we can, we can have that conversation about anybody in terms of what they do and what they leave behind them, what they do in the world. Uh -huh. But it's, it's still kind of jarring to watch Robert Blake constantly play cops and, um, you know, upstanding characters with the exception of in cold blood. He didn't play a lot of villains and yeah, I'm mad at him for selling himself that well <laughs> in a weird way. I mean, I know that's naive, but that's just, yeah. that's going through my head. Does it ever come up? Do you, is it something that you think about? You know, it's it's not come up. I, I've done some screenings of this where I've talked about it. That hasn't come up in that conversation. I I guess I was, I don't know if lucky is the right word. I didn't really know anything about Robert. I had kind of heard, vaguely knew the name mm -hmm. when, I watched, uh, when I watched the movie for the first time. And so it, it wasn't mixed in with these other things. Then somebody else brought it up. And I'm like, and I tried to understand a little more what happened. Um, and I'm not sure I still understand really what happens. I understand that, you know, he was uh, found not guilty on the criminal charges, but then he had to end up paying um, in, the civil civil, suit, yeah. in the civil suit. Um, I'm not sure what that means. And I think that it's, it's a real question and I may be very wrong as to, you know, my perspective on this but you know the right now my, that perspective is um awful people can sometimes do some good things um achieve achieve some good things um without erasing the whole of them um and, and that means without erasing the bad parts too sure being conscious of it and not just saying you know you know that somehow there this is a place where we can we can completely compartmentalize um but i can i'm still able to appreciate um 
mostly through um, what James Gersio does. Um, I think he lives up to everything in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think Robert Blake is very good in the movie. Yeah. And he contributed a lot to the movie. Like some of the scenes we were talking about were improvs and other things he came up with. Um, yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's a charming, capable actor in this film. And uh -huh. it's, it's, uh, it's exactly that. You can, you, you don't, we're, we're at a point right now, I think culturally, where the response to a revelation about anyone is to, the, I mean, the word cancel is thrown around all the time. This mm -hmm. person is canceled. But that's not what happens, right? You can, you can declare someone over, but then you're left with their legacy. And yeah, I, you know, uh, well, People you know, make actually, maybe this stays. maybe this is actually tied to the movie a little more thematically than you know it seemed at, yeah. at first, which is that you know the the idea of canceled is um, is a kind of certainty that you know I don't feel in a lot of the uh, issues of our time that are brought up, or at least there's fundamentally some questions there. And it's not that I see uh, an equality of voices on both sides or arguments on both sides, but I can understand multiple arguments um, having some validity. Yeah, now, true. your moral, how you face it is you weigh those. But to say that the outcome of that weighing is obvious, I think, does a disservice to how complicated some of these matters are. Mm -hmm. And also how personal that weighing is. Yeah, exactly. I, the, the biggest arguments I'm seeing now in terms of social media and, and co the conversation in, in cultural uh, terms are that everyone has a separate idea of what the response should be. And because everyone, because there's a spectrum of responses, uh, people are angry with each other over not agreeing immediately that their opinion is correct. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the... The progressive movement keeps tearing itself apart is because we can't agree on the level of agreement and we don't have the conversation about the problem yeah uh, we have the conversation about the response to the problem or or just um i i think that there is a i like to think that we can be generous in understanding that people struggle mm -hmm. with some of these things i remember um with for example an issue like marriage equality sure you know uh, i I loved hearing Evan Wolfson talk about the issue because he would talk about like, you know, there's going to be some people who are very uncomfortable and that's a real thing and we have to help them through that. Yeah. Um, we can't pretend it doesn't exist and we can't pretend that they're awful people. Um, or maybe we can, but it doesn't help us in progress. And I think that even something like, you know, you, you look at me and you're like, oh, well, okay, I, I, I must be some sort of expert on Asian American issues and representation and things like that. I've had to be helped through understanding issues of casting, of representation, and other things hmm. by other people, sometimes Asian Americans, sometimes others, who think about these things a lot more and help me understand. And so that idea that, you know, people need help through thinking about these as opposed to being slapped if they're not in line is, um, I think, just practically you lose a lot of people who could be on your side. They're not there yet. You know, they're not in agreement yet, but they could be mm -hmm. um, if you help them through these steps to understand. And I think it is understanding and answering questions and, and because it's, it's not obvious. Yeah. I've seen your work. You're an optimist. <laughs> You're a human. I mean, you're a humanist. You believe in you, your films. Seem to believe in the best of people. That's. I mean, certainly what in the family is about. Yeah, it's is about reaching people, and yeah. and uh, I mean, Bread Factory is about the conflict between people, not positions, not movements. It's about the individual human frailties that keep us from understanding each other, and, mm -hmm. uh, and on a larger scale, uh, the world. But um, but it is, yeah. It, I, I'm glad to hear that because I I feel like I'm constantly um, struck by the absolutism that's being thrown around in everything, and mm -hmm. not just the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement is the one place I think where we need the absolutism, where you know people have to be held accountable for 
bad acts, for assaults, for violations, and all of these things. But we're also at a place where people are starting to exploit the cynicism of it, when someone is exposed as uh, an annoyance rather than a monster, they, you know, you wait three days and someone else will be exposed as a worse monster and you can write it out. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gaming of the system that started to happen, which I find distressing. And there, there when... Um, uh, well, again, with Bohemian Rhapsody, it's just it's the it's the thing that's sticking in my mind right now. The idea that that film is somehow the narrative behind that movie was isn't it great that it was finished at all because we had to fire Brian Singer and that was their recovery narrative. Mm-hmm. But it's a mess, and to see it win the editing <clears throat> the the editing prizes that it won was just how good is the PR on that that you can make this a virtue that this film could have been so much worse if we hadn't you know if these heroic technicians hadn't gotten behind it and saved it and that seems cynical to me as well and, mm-hmm. and so we're in this space now where we know what we need to do and there are people already working to work within it and to subvert it and turn it to their own purposes and that's exhausting and angry and and i like the clarity of that a movie like electric high and blue provides where you can see right and wrong it's so well it's so interesting you call it clarity because um i was just about to say that when i get confused by these sorts of issues i try to organize them th- and under look at them through a narrative okay not describe them not they don't become a linear thing and a clear thing but organize them so that i can think about them a little more clear clearly and i think that that's the clarity is that you're in the hands of someone who has curated these moments from people's lives um, very carefully uh, so that you can think about a really rich set of things. Um, easier than if I just say, Vietnam War, go. Yeah. You know, or if I just want to say, American Dream, go. Um, it gives a beautiful, dramatic focus. And I think that what's interesting is when James Curcio talks about, you know, he thinks of film as architecture, you know, there's a many elements coming, uh, many arts coming together. And the ones he calls out are photography, uh, drama, and literature. Okay. Which is very interesting that, uh, I don't know how carefully he thought through, you know, what he was listing off. It's uh, it's sort of on the fly kind of conversation we're having here. Yeah, but you don't pull literature out but of that's, nowhere. But that's wonderful. Yeah, and I love that. And especially because I remember... Or you have, uh, what was it, um, you've had other directors write, uh, you know, books and saying these are the, you know, the sort of the, the artistic streams um, that come into uh, a film. And a lot of people nowadays, especially say music. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very interesting. He as a music producer didn't say music. Yeah, that, I would have thought that that would have been, especially the way he uses it in the film. That yeah. Would have been an element, but, but I like that he says it. literature. Uh, it says a lot about his values, I think, in terms of how deeply we want to dive into the context of people's lives, not just actions, mm-hmm. you know, and deeply into the psychology of people's lives. And that it gives us, yeah, a, a really nice canvas for looking at these very, very messy issues. Yeah. Well, and to that end, I mean, is there anything of Electric Light and Blue that you have borrowed or uh, stolen or absorbed into your own creative DNA. I mean, it kind of feels like there's a commonality with your work. I I think I saw it late enough that I didn't... Ha- I haven't had time to steal from it yet. Okay. <laughs> but also, I think that the things I borrow... For example, there was a movie... Uh, the Grief of Others, my second movie, uh, one of the touchstones was uh, The Hired Hand. But it you know, maybe one or two things we we, stole, we took a little more literally. Sure. But everything else is you borrow from the spirit um, of what the thing has accomplished before you. And you learn from it. And you can't quite draw straight lines. Maybe you can't afterwards with the help of critics or other people pointing things out. Yeah. But, you know, the, the nature of how we as humans take things in, uh, digest them... Um, and also for me, when I make a movie, I have n- rarely, rarely have a, a desire to um, replicate or point to something so specific. Sure. I'm a little too wrapped up in what the, figuring out what the thing itself is. Okay. And it tells you something. Um, and it's often a surprise. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, it's, it may be better to look at Electric Light as more like a really great, you know, talking about literature, a really great novel. Mm-hmm. 
that sticks with me um, and that I think about and think about and think about. Yeah. This might be the opposite example of that in that I didn't realize when you suggested I didn't realize you'd seen it late or so much further along in your career. Yeah. Uh, but it is, it's, it's the reverse. It's not what inspired you, but it's exactly the sort of thing that you would react to, that you would It's a kindred to. spirit. Yes, yeah, yes, its exactly. values. Yeah, and especially in how... I think those are the movies I respond most to, is the director has a love for what actors can do, but also just a love for people. Um, and I think that those are the ones I really connect with. And so... It's really from uh, an overlap in our value system mm -hmm. um, more than anything else. Well, I'm glad you found it in that yeah. case. Because it's, it's always lovely to find something that you can instantly recognize your own interests in and your own concerns. It's a, yeah, and it used to, you know, we find it in all things. I find it a lot of, uh, mostly it's dead authors. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, it's nice when it can be a film. It's nice when it can be a piece of music. But yeah, this... Uh, this is one I could, and we've talked about it for a long time. I could talk about it for hours and hours more. Yeah, oh, that's great. But I won't keep you. <laughs> My thanks to Patrick Wang, whose new film, A Bread Factory, is now available on iTunes and streaming on Mubi in the U.S. It'll be available on Blu-ray and DVD November 5th from Grasshopper Film, which is also distributing Patrick's other films, In the Family and the Grief of Others, in the U.S. and Canada. Thanks also to Peter Kaplowski. He knows what he did. You can find Patrick on Twitter at Wang on the Web, all one word, and you can find Electroglide in Blue on Blu-ray and DVD from Shout Factory. It's also available on Epics and Voodoo in the U.S. And that restored Blu-ray of the Hired Hand we were talking about is available from Arrow Video in the U.S. and Canada. It came out last fall, and it's loaded with extras. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you feel like leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you enjoy the show, that would be greatly appreciated. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network. They're pretty good. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. We'll see you next week when we drop our 250th episode. Can you believe it? I can't. Take care. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud.